Uh, hey everybody and welcome to Warwick. Um, for those of you who don't know, Warwick is a global law firm with about 1,100 lawyers. We represent a lot of technology companies and investors in technology companies. And we have a program called Total Access. Total Access is intended to generate uh, sort of insights and learning for entrepreneurs. Um, and as part of that, we put together um, teaching sessions, uh, coaching sessions. We've got uh, uh, online forums and term sheet generators that are free to entrepreneurs and others. Uh, and we put together panel discussions like today. Um, so we're really happy to have this particular panel together, which was uh, curated, uh, if I can use that overused word, uh, by Nahal Mehta, who I think is pretty well known uh, in this community and probably to everyone in this room uh, as, as being uh, sort of an extraordinary entrepreneur and investor uh, here in New York in mobile technologies. So, uh, you know, today we're going to sort of discuss the state of the state, and uh, Nahal would we'll, uh, leave it to you to kick things off. Awesome. Uh, David, thanks for having us. Uh, this is a good looking crowd. I'm talking about us, by the way. Um, so, thanks everybody uh, for coming. We're going to talk about, about mobile advertising. First, quick show of hands. How many people have a phone? <laughs> So a couple of you guys, that's pretty good. In a few years, everybody will have a phone, <laughs> yeah. believe it or not. How many people have, have actually seen a mobile ad on your phone? So, okay. all, so also just a <laughs> do not click it, uh, because uh, it's spam. No, um, so that's good. Also, a few of you, more of you will see mobile ads in the future. How many of you have uh, accidentally clicked on a mobile ad? Put your hands down. Put your hands down. Um, so we call that the fat finger syndrome. And it's not because your fingers are fat, it's because the ads are too freaking small. And so a lot of companies here, are, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to fix that problem. How many of you have seen a, a video ad on your, on your mobile device? OK. So much more to grow. This is cool. Yes, and that was a direct plug for you, Zane. Thank you. Okay. By the way, I'm moderating, not you, just so you know. Um, and uh, so that's great. How many, how many folks have actually bought something after clicking on a mobile ad. What did you buy back there? You. Yes. Uh, Hi. Was, hey, Judd. How are you? Uh, I think it was a book. You bought a book. Yeah. Sweet. Who else? Anybody else? Anybody you didn't buy a car on their phone? <laughs> no, not yet. Okay. So good. Just good. Uh, kind of baseline to. to I, I do this kind of at every every panel. Kind of over the past. 14 years, and it's pretty amazing to see the growth. Everybody in this room does have a phone, which is great. Everybody in this room has seen a mobile ad. Everybody's probably clicked on a mobile ad. So mobile advertising is real. Um, last year, you guys probably already know this, but just to frame the conversation, last year, you know, roughly about $400 billion were spent on advertising in the, U in the US. Um, believe it or not, you know, only 1% was spent on, on mobile advertising. Um, which is crazy. You guys have seen this Mary Meeker slide where it shows the time spent on mobile devices versus the ad spend. And there's this huge discrepancy, right? I think this year right now, for it to take a pulse, particularly amongst these demographics, close to 30, 40% of our time spent, maybe more on mobile, right? More than TV. Uh, but yet ad spend this year might only be 3% uh, of total budget. So there's a lot of issues why mobile advertising is not broken out into the mainstream. Um, these issues are going to be solved very quickly, and these issues are going to be solved by a lot of these companies on this panel. But fast forward two, three years from now, mobile advertising will represent, I'd say, 30 percent. Uh, bold statement. Feel free to tweet that, by the way. The hashtag is hashtag mobile ad. Uh, 30 percent uh, of budgets, over $100 billion of advertising we put into mobile advertising. There's a lot of upside here. Um, and there's roadblocks to overcome. We're going to talk about those roadblocks today. Um, so before we start, I um, want everybody to introduce themselves, uh, talk a little about themselves, their companies. Uh, if you promote your companies, uh, even though you're my near dear friends and investments, um, Hadley of Lee will escort you out of the room. OK. Well, you can promote them, not just, just don't over promote them. Yeah, cool. So my name is Zane, and I, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Vungle. I started the company because I hate ads, which is pretty funny because Vungo is an ads company. But what we do is we power video advertising inside of some of the world's biggest apps. We're in thousands of applications, including Supercell, Electronic Arts, and Sega. That was pretty good. Um, hi, I'm uh, Brian Long, the CEO and founder of uh, Tap Commerce. 
Uh, we focus on retargeting for mobile applications. So uh, if you're shopping within, um, say, uh, eBay and thinking about bidding on something, uh, then you go to another app. We show ads that remind you to go back and uh, bid again because you've been outbid. Hi, my name is Peter. I am the head of product engineering at uh, App Savvy, and we are a advertising platform that runs on both web and mobile. And I think two of the th philosophies that we run on uh, primarily are on intelligent targeting, uh, specifically uh, on what do users do in real time and what those activities mean about them and what can we translate from those activities to how they may be receptive to advertising. And the second philosophy is really about the native delivery of advertising. How do we deliver ads in a way that doesn't um, disrupt the user experience, minimize the disruption of user experience? Hi, I'm Dmitry, I'm, and I'm from a company called Mighty Meeting. And I actually represent the customer of, the, of these people here. Uh, we have a repository of content. People upload their presentations, videos, uh, data sheets, and then they share that content from multiple channels. So I have a huge repository of content that I can monetize using advertising, and I also have mobile applications that I can promote using mobile advertising. Cool. All right, so uh, we're going to play a quick game. Who here had an iPad four years ago? Trick question didn't exist then. Who has an iPad now? So pretty amazing. Fastest growing consumer device ever. My name is Jason Baptiste. Started a company called OnSwipe, which is the largest publishing and advertising platform on the tablet, you know, reaching more, twice as many people as Tumblr in the US on the iPad. What do we do? Essentially, we let a publisher make their content a beautiful, swipeable experience. That increases revenue and page views instantly overnight. <clears throat> awesome. So uh, we have four ad networks, I guess five including me, but I'm not going to be in these conversations, and then one publisher, effectively. A at, the, at the end of the panel, actually, uh, Dimitri is going to get pitched by all these guys and pick a, a mobile ad network to work with. Yeah, have a checkbook right here. Quick correction, we're not an ad network. OK, fine, Jason. Bad word. Also, I'm, I'm moderating, Jason. So, um, <laughs> so let's talk about, um, let's talk about ROI, let's jump into this, you know, head first. Like this is the, the, the you know, when, when a customer uh, gives you guys an insertion order for 100 grand, they want to see that they got at least 100 grand worth, right? And so how do you, how do you prove that? And let's, let's go to everybody. How, how do you prove that this thing works so this customer comes back? Let's start over here. Well, in our case, we're completely on the line because we charge on an install basis. So this is apps promoting other apps. And here's the cool thing. We only get paid when someone watches a video, then decides to click, then goes to the app store and downloads the app. But it continues beyond that. If that user isn't valuable, those advertisers aren't going to spend with us. So we're completely on the line, and we only get paid on performance. We do also work with brands who pay on a view basis, and that's one of the bigger problems with mobile. How do you actually quantify ROI? And I think I'll pass it over to you, because you have the answer, I believe. Yeah, so we, we pick off where Zane leaves off. Um, we um, uh, target people beyond the install. So after you've already installed a mobile application, we're working in order to bring you back and ultimately convert customers into purchases. To answer your question, Nahal, uh, we look at conversions being purchase events or other events that are very important to uh, the advertiser or publisher. Uh, so we're looking at click-through conversions. And we're also looking at view-through conversions. Um, on the topic of view-through conversions, uh, within the web, a lot of people talk about view-through uh, view conversions being how many people saw the ad, didn't click on it, but subsequently took an action, and how much just, just seeing the ad affect things. Uh, on the web, in a lot of cases, ads will be shown um, below the fold, so you have to scroll down, or there will be small text ads. So there's a lot of um, discussion around whether or not that holds a lot of value. In mobile, though, if the ad is uh, served on the phone, you're going to see it. It's taking up a minimum of 15% of the screen, and in many cases, taking up the whole screen. So we are seeing some, some pretty interesting trends on how much uh, ads are affecting purchasing behavior, uh, even if the user doesn't actually click on that ad. Mm -hmm. I'll pick up. No, I'm just kidding. So from our side, um, our mobile ads actually are all full screen. So in this case, because they're all full screen, the um, the viewability issue is not in question.
but what's actually in question in majority of our insertion orders is not views. It's more about the interactions that users have taken. Uh, and these interactions can range from click-throughs. These interactions can be from starting a video, has a, how much the video has the person watched. And some of them are very specific. They will only pay us, uh, for example, if they uh, watch the quarter. Some of them say 30 seconds. And in this case, uh, my point of view on this is the more transparency we can share with the advertisers about what the user actually is doing in terms of before the ad and also what the person is interacting with the ad. Um, uh, for example, we can replay the session of, of the moment the ad is requested and three, days, three seconds later the person click on this, uh, on the ad itself. And those kind of information is, prop, is what the advertisers, at least for us, uh, look for and understand um, their ROI. Yes, and uh, as an advertiser or, or a publisher, I guess from my perspective, the most important part is your user experience. If I add something to my application, I would, love, uh, I would like people to not be turned off by, by advertising so that they can keep using the application. Engagement to me is, is very important. After engagement, the, the most important part is conversion. Uh, so I would actually like people to use the ad, so it has to be part of the experience. And conversion <coughs> is also driven by targeting. So. Uh, I would love to be able to say, you know, uh, particularly in my case, uh, the, the solution is used by educators and salespeople, so I would like to reach all salespeople in New York. So if I can easily define that category, it would be invaluable to me, right? And, uh, and last but not least is uh, how easy it is for me, for me to use in th uh, through different channels. So I have apps in HTML5, on Android, uh, on iOS, different platforms, and also coming up Google Glass, you know? Can I use one SDK and one targeting platform for me to reach all my different customers through all the different channels? So those are the important parts that, that I'm looking for. Cool. So um, you know, we're focused on a different part of the spectrum. We're focused on the branded top of the funnel advertising, which people hate online ads. But you know what they love? They love magazine ads that just do it's the think difference. How do you take that emotion and bring it online? You don't fix advertising by actually fixing the ad itself. You fix where it's sitting. So that's why we start as a publisher platform first. Essentially, you know, hundreds of publishers that we work with before us, they've been in kind of call it the bad neighborhoods of the web. We're taking all of them and putting them in beautiful multi-million dollar beachfront property overnight. And that's what advertisers care about. Great environments, 100% viewability, 100% share of voice. And then they can put in beautiful storytelling ads because that's where people are going to pay attention. It's about branded, beautiful, high impact, and great real estate for brands. So, uh, so Jason, how do you calculate uh, ROI on, on those? on those branded ads? Yeah, you know, it's, it's going to vary, right? So we did uh, one campaign where it was brand recall. That was kind of the ROI. So we did a study with Comscore out of all the different places, TV, tablet, and we were the only tablet buy. So it wasn't, hey, we were riding on somebody's coattails. Far and above, ours was 79%. You know, the second highest was maybe 49%. That's one. Two is click-through rate or engagement still matters. Our video ad had a 30% engagement rate, and then even traditional banner ads were you know, 10 time, more than 10 times higher than normal 0.1% click-through rate. So those are the two uh, measurements that mattered. Got it. The reason uh, why this is so important is brand dollars are really going to help drive this next generation of mobile advertising. Right? To date, it's been largely bottom of the funnel, direct response, search. That's been making up, you know, constituting a billion plus in, in mobile ad revenue. Now all the brand dollars are starting to flow in. So, um, and by bottom of the funnel, I mean closer to conversion, right? These are advertisers more like a Pizza Hut or a Geico um, versus top of the funnel. You know, Jason mentioned the, the Just Do It's and the Think Difference, the, the Apples and the Nikes, folks that buy TV commercials, folks that take out magazine ads, right? As soon as we can start getting those guys to, to spend in mobile advertising, then it's then it's happening. And I think, Jason, you're on the frontier. I think when you can start showing ROI to these advertisers, right, that's when those budgets will start flowing. And tracking is another one. I mean, you know that very well. Any, uh, any other comments on, on top of the funnel, bottom yeah, of the funnel? Just to expand on that, what's important to understand is when we talk about top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, let's dive deeper there. What does DR mean for us, actually? And people need to realize this. Mobile is being held up right now by lots of apps promoting other apps. That's why Facebook launched app installs. It's a big business out there. And these guys continue to spend. This allows companies in our space to scale. They only spend $5, for example, per user if they make more than $5 back. 
And that's, that's something that keeps on scaling and scaling. But eventually, for the real money to flow into mobile, we have to see those brand dollars come. And those brand dollars will come from television advertising. As that changes and goes through online and goes to mobile, that's when things will really get interesting. Another interesting dimension is you have these app install ads, but you also have these brand ads. What do you decide to show when and to which user? If I make a mistake and I show someone a brand ad when they could have installed an app ad, I would have made three or four bucks from that user. But instead, I made one or two cents. So a lot of the back end is technology and making sure you show the right type of ad to the right user. And if you can get performance and brand right, that's a big business you can build. Yeah, and actually, from my, from my personal experience, uh, most of my the dollars that I'm exposed to are actually brand dollars because of the way um, we position ourselves and also our expertise. And over the last two years, I think it's not less, I'm thinking backwards, uh, we are seeing more brand dollars coming through. And also, I think they're also maturing in terms of um, how specific, uh, this kind of ties in ROI, of asking for uh, perhaps guarantees. Uh, for example, one of the things we started doing a couple months ago is also making sure that even though this could be a CPM campaign, for example, uh, there's always some underlying performance metric that the brand cares for, but they may not be very explicit in their RFP, for example. We ask, what is it you really care for? Is it, is it the click? Is it the video views? Because the often in one single ad on, on phone, for example, there's a, a 30 second video with a CTA right below it. Which one do you care for? And I think just get that kind of agreement and understanding at the beginning of it buys that kind of confidence that brand advertisers seem to be hesitant in terms of investing. And that and I hope that as more people do that, there'll be more of a, uh, a conversation and feedback loop that can grow the, uh, the industry. Brian, any comments? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that when, when you brought up that stat in the beginning, talking about how only 1% of dollars were coming into mobile, it's just astonishing to me how you can see people all day long spending all of their time on their phone now. Even when I'm at home now and I'm like, my, you know, my, my wife will be sitting next to me watching a movie, we're both on our phones, you know, doing something while the movie's on and we're paying a lot more attention to the phone than the movie. Are, are you emailing each other? What are you doing we're, with that? <laughs> we're, we're actually, yeah, we're, we're Snapchatting back and forth. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Got yeah. it. <laughs> but, um, I, I just find that the, the fact that the sheer amount of eyeballs and time spent on mobile is there and the fact that it's only 1%, is it being held up because of the way you know, agencies sort of work today and, and that they might just be slower to pick up where the spending is coming from? Or, you know, another thing that we, I, and I certainly agree with the comments that made by the rest of the panel on brand. I think brand is a ton of room to move uh, within mobile, but I also think as we see continued purchase behavior move to mobile with people getting the user experience right, uh, we see leading e-commerce companies talking about doing 40, 50% of transactions on smartphones now. As that transaction's occurring on the phone, the ability for folks like us and, and other people here to advertise with those people, to drive those transactions and additional transactions is also greatly lifted. So when you see people actually purchasing things on phones, that makes driving the ROI question a lot easier and in a lot of ways helps us um, to, to, to actually drive that end transaction because you know, we don't all control that user experience at the end. Yeah, so just to build on Brian and Demetrius' point, it is about user experience. The reason advertising is such a dirty word is because it does suck. The way advertising works today is awful. People port what works online onto mobile, and they don't respect that mobile is a native experience. It's something that's completely different. It's a different paradigm. You have to build for the user experience first. Now, today, a lot of the ads you see are these awful display ads and text ads that are intrusive. But the way content consumption is changing, not just that Brian and his girlfriend or wife are, are communicating with each other next to each other, but if you have a child or a kid and you hey, put wait, them in front of back up. Yeah. Brian's girlfriend and wife no, all no, communicating no, 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 with each other. I didn't realize which one it was. <laughs> Just, just wife. Just, just wife. wife, okay. Yeah, right. Brian's wife, who used to be his girlfriend. This panel was about to get a lot more interesting. That works. All right. But look, if any of you guys have kids, okay, and you put a kid in front of a TV, they'll try to touch the TV. These kids are growing up in a world where content has to be interactive, it has to be immersive. The kind of advertising units you see today, banner ads and text ads, are not going to be around in the future. Advertising has to be immersive and engaging and all about the user experience. And he's about to say something. Go for it. Yeah, so here's, here's the thing, right? We keep talking publisher and advertiser. I think it's 
publisher and brand or content site and brand because they're both publishers the best the best advertisers and brands take amex for example they're publishing content they're approaching even their traditional banner ad or full page ad like a piece of content and that's what matters you look at the cmos at these big companies they're investing in the brand as a publisher technology to do that there's a company called news cred right which works with brands to help them publish great content you know Percolate. I mean, there's a whole thesis, even the share throughs of the world, where they say, hey, you've created great content. Let's put that in looking and feeling like content in other people's sites as a brand. That's what I think the future is. If anybody is here on the brand side, just treat advertising as publishing content and happens to be paid to get somewhere, and you'll succeed. Yeah, just a quick uh, thing we always talk about in our local response. When an ad becomes so targeted, uh, it's content, right? And, and that's the holy grail of advertising, right? Google that, did it. Right. Um, we wanted to try to avoid the, the, the big G word on this panel, but, <laughs> but that's OK. Uh, yeah, you broke it out. Um, let's talk about um, a little bit about uh, ad units and, and native versus non-native and what you guys are seeing perform. So I alluded in the beginning to that fat finger syndrome, right, which is um, where often your finger is bigger than this banner ad you know, across all these publishers. and. Now, you know, the MMA and the IAB have created these standard formats for buying at scale that unfortunately is still constrained to these ad units. However, we've seen a lot of other amazing response in other types of ad units and more specifically even native ad units. So let's, let's talk about that. Anybody? Jump in. Certainly we've, uh, and I think Peter could speak to this too, we've seen a large growth uh, in the amount of uh, full screen uh, ad units over the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, from being a pretty small percentage of inventory uh, now uh, growing pretty steadily quarter over quarter. And you know that, that's great for being able to do video, being able to do uh, brand ads, and then also for, for people like us, you can uh, highlight, you know, we highlight what products you recently looked at uh, within a, an e-commerce application, and you can swipe through those different products and see what you might be recommended based on that. So it gives you a lot more room and, um, and, and gets to what uh, Zane was saying before on thinking about what's a really good uh, experience for the customer and, and gives us a lot more pixels to work with. So I, I think that's going to continue to to grow a lot. And that, that user experience um, is you actually see a uh, standard MMA size ad, you click on it, and then it goes full screen, or is it full screen to begin with? There's a lot of full screens to begin with, but also you know people picking up MRAID as a as a spec and allowing you to have easy expand to a full screen um, is something that we see across RTB inventory uh, taking over you know very quickly. The MRAID spec, which is sort of like the rich media spec for mobile, has has picked up very quickly. Yeah, we took a very different approach. We hands up said, forget these standards. This is what's wrong with advertising today. We're going to push our own standard. And the world looked at us and said, are you crazy? How are you going to change the advertising industry? And I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to do something big. But here's, here's where things get interesting. When it comes to video, the standards that exist today are not conducive for mobile apps. For example, when we serve our video ads, they're pre-cached in the background. So you don't have any of this annoying streaming or buffering issues. So our view has been, let's focus on user experience. and we'll eventually impact the standards once we have scale. And we've been able to build a pretty big business today, and we have access to so many impressions, and we power so many uh, ads inside of big publishers, but we can now influence the standards. We're on the boards of the uh, IAB and the MMA, and we're trying to push that the way online works just isn't going to work in mobile. You have to focus on the native experience. Part of the problem is that you've got a lot of traditional folks out there. And this is a bigger problem with advertising, too. There's this uh, focus on it used to work and traditional, therefore it must work online, and we just port that over to mobile, too. What you've got to realize is what's holding advertising back as an industry overall is that the people who control the budgets are the guys who grew up in the world of television, of print, of billboards. Today, though, we're living in a world of social media, of applications. It's a very different world, and we're waiting for a generational shift to occur and people to appreciate that it has to be native from the very ground up. Yeah, I just want to say that native and targeting are very much related. Native implies that it's part of your experience flow. So in order to deliver that kind of experience, you need to know, you need to personalize content to the audience that is receiving that content. And that is a big problem, right? Because very often when you advertise on a mobile device, you don't have the, the rich targeting information that is required to deliver that. So that is a very big challenge. So like one 
one quote from uh, one of our board members is that if the internet was religion, you know, scale would be God, and like your job as CEO is to go go find God because that's what matters, right? Like, so we keep talking native, native, native. We've got cool custom ad units, unless you have scale and an easy way to implement it, so repeatable and scalable, nobody's gonna buy it. So the first thing you have to do is, how do you find a unique way to make this scalable? Not a one-off test budget of 25K, but that they can do repeated six-figure buys. You know, I'll tell you like on the full page side, it's big in the app world, because hey, there's a lot of swiping in between interstitials. On the web, which is you know kind of the big denotion is we only play in the web. No apps, all HTML5, you know, we had our own interstitial standard that's getting great pickup. We figured, hey, it's big in the app world. There must be a lot of backfill through either AdX, other ad part, you know, a ton of different people. It doesn't exist. The web is so much slower, and I think the reason the app world has these new creative formats like Vungle and App Savvy is the fact that you know they didn't have to worry about what was going on in the old school. It wasn't you know budgets of 720 by 90s and 300 by 600. It was a beginner's mind and new place to start. I think that's where the web needs to go. Is throw out everything else and just start from the beginning. How should the web look? Not how do we you know pigeonhole kind of the desktop into the mobile web. Jason, I think you touched on a very interesting point a few moments ago, especially regarding test budgets. What's fascinating as an entrepreneur in this space, and the investors will love this part, okay, is that it's quite easy to get the business going in the beginning. You can get test budgets all day long, but when you're investing in a company, ask how many of those test budgets have actually renewed? Because brands are fickle, they'll spend everywhere. They're mandated to test new technology all the time. But to go from that test budget to repeatable scalable revenue is a completely different business altogether. And that's, that's, when, that's when things work and you've got the unit economics sorted out. And what, what range do you consider a test budget? I'm, I'm curious what everybody on the... On the, on the Hall's panel considers a test budget. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jason. Well, we have two different kinds of uh, advertisers. Like I said, we have our performance-based advertisers and our brand-based advertisers. The brand-based advertisers, anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000. We've had a couple of 100K test budgets, too. Uh, those are really exciting. But on the, on the app side, uh, it's much smaller. Yep. And in our case, we don't want them to test and not see a result. We want to improve an ROI. So we even say, look, we've got a video ad created for you free of charge because we'll only get paid if that unit converts. And put $1,000, put $5,000. Let's make sure that you are seeing value. Otherwise, you're not going to spend with us, and we can't build a business if we can't deliver you value long term. 25K? A bit. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so <laughs> from our side, uh, what's interesting is I think Test budget, we've, we definitely had our shares of test budgets at least at the beginning of the platform. And uh, the numbers have ranged, but I think 15,000 or so is around what we're seeing. And I was just thinking back also just you know, the kind of brand dots we've seen so far, the formats they like, and kind of repeats, kind of to Jason, to your points. And on our platform, the three top sectors that I know are doing repeats are CPG, finance, and telecom. You know, more like the Amax, the Campbells, and the Samsons. And the reason they have repeat buys um, in six digits are mostly because of performance, actually. You know, we guarantee certain CTAs and say this is performing well. And, and in terms of kind of the, the, the native piece, I know, I know we uh, perhaps differ in the exact definition of it, um, but I look at it very much in terms of user experience as well. And one of the things that we have been experimenting with since the beginning and continue want to improve on is not just the ad unit itself, uh, as, as the creative, the video, et cetera, but more about the transition between what the user was doing within the app itself to the, to the ad. So for, to, in, in the app to the ad. So for example, should we put a, in TV world, there's always the fade in black and it comes up and, and, and then go into the ad, et cetera. Can we do some sort of transition? Should we do some sort of overlay? Uh, what about the swiping motion that the user was doing just prior to uh, the ad appearing? Should we do the same kind of motion in order to make that more native? And those are very subtle elements, but I think that kind of polish uh, what I consider makes it better. And I think, you know, some of the, some of the magazines, like Fast Company Magazine, has done, I think, one of the best jobs uh, in terms of beautiful ads in, in you know, mm -hmm. very immersive. You know, the latest, I think the latest issue had a virtual reality um, built in. You can look around the car or you can look around, I think the mm -hmm. office of J. Crew. It wasn't really a, an ad per se, but 
those kind of beautiful experiences compared to, for example, Bloomberg Newsweek, uh, Business Week, which I you know I look at every week. Very two very different experiences. But I think if you know Bloomberg can catch up where fast company is, that's a much better experience, and that's where the dollar will, will flow. Yeah, what, what Jason was alluding to, I think the, the beauty is kind of inversely proportional to, to scale, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, there's mm -hmm. very few publishers that, like a fast company, mm -hmm. that can take in hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of ads, mm -hmm. of, of budget to facilitate those ads, right? I think there's Facebook and Twitter, right, obviously are one of the top mobile ad networks, and they can do that. They can do that natively, right? But outside, I mean, a lot of us are beholden to publishers that might not be able to have, you know, any type of interactive format, right? Yeah, right. It may, yeah. Native, native ads and uh, repeatability may be an oxymoron because uh, repeatability requires standardization, and that means ad unit, right, to, to some extent, so. Um, that's, that's also why, you know, I'm hoping that, uh, but I think standard interesting is interesting word because IAB is such as you know, has a very strong hold in terms of what's considered standard. But to me, the way I see standard is how many people are using it. That's really becoming the standard. Whether it's that IAB standard unit, whether it's uh, whether it's, it's on the home page, we can download spec. That actually doesn't matter to to me. Uh, what matters is what do brands care for, and what are they willing to spend money on. That become, that will become the standard. Let's talk about. Um you alluded to some verticals that are that are working well, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's talk about just even specific clients, if you can. Who are your, your top three spenders? I think everybody in the panel has, you know, you guys are generating um, multi-million dollars in revenue, so these clients obviously are, are not are not small names. Um, who do you think are, are the most aggressive um, clients, you know, across your across your ad portfolio, client portfolio? We're lucky that we have a good, diverse group of clients, but who's aggressive? Everyone's played Candy Crush Saga. King.com spends money everywhere. Same with Supercell. Supercell is buying users left, right, and center. And even though we charge quite a, quite a bit, you know, it's about 5 to $10 per user, they're saying, how can we get more installs? These users are valuable. So we, we see those guys, the top grossing guys. But they can only do that because they have a good handle on the economics. They understand the average user, to me, is worth X amount. It's very different to brands. Brand awareness is important, but you'd run a risk because you, in mobile, you can buy Super Bowl scale every single day and you can burn through money like that. So you can't play that game necessarily. Yeah, so we focus on retargeting, so it tends to be people who want to drive traffic back to their app or mobile or tablet website to drive a conversion. So our, our customers tend to be those that um, have fantastic mobile experiences that are converting uh, to a sale. Uh, so we work with a lot of the leaders in the e-commerce space, you know, people like Fab, Jack, Thread, Zulily, uh, and then when we look at, um, you know, what else is making a lot of money, obviously on the gaming side, they're they're excellent at converting people uh, to purchase. So you know, we work with uh, Supercell and Zynga and folks like that. Uh, then uh, when you know, continuing to look at who's monetizing really well, uh, we see a lot of the the dating and social related companies beginning to figure out um, how to really monetize their subscriptions and make a great mobile experience. Um, and travel um, travel has picked up a lot too uh, in terms of people uh, finalizing a trip or setting up a last minute hotel. I mean, if anyone's following a Hotel Tonight recently did a very uh, large round. So that you look at that's just a, a perfect example. And once you use Hotel Tonight, you just won't use something else when you're traveling because it's so phenomenal. It's just a fantastic experience and great value. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for my, you know, I mentioned before, the CPG definitely I think is number one sector for us, and it has been for at least the last two years. Any particular clients? With sure, uh, Campbell's, Phil, uh, Pillsbury. Uh, I think those two come up to mind. And actually, one one sector that's rising uh, is actually entertainment for me. Uh, for example, CBS or Sony. You know, I think it's because because of the ubiquity of video uh, yep. uh, that's happening across the becoming. A huge push, and, and people do enjoy a very immersive video ad. Yeah, uh, did you guys see a lot of? We see a lot of movie trailers coming our way as well. Yeah, because that works. Those are definitely seasonal, summer, uh, fall right now. Of course, you know, lots of push in terms of new shows that's that's coming back on TV, etc. So, uh, yeah, those are the sectors for us. Well, I, I don't sell, uh, but my comment would be that in order for 
for an advertiser to, to benefit from mobile advertising, they must be able to convert that user on the mobile platform. And the, the types of the companies that can do that today, that's not a big set. And that may explain the 1% that we are currently experiencing. I come from, a, from the web, web content management world, and that industry spent like 15, 20 years building that capability, you know, going from a web uh, advertising to a web customer. On the mobile platform, that is not yet happening. So I guess when, when that audience expands, then you will see more companies purchasing advertising on mobile. Yeah. I'd say uh, one of the, you know, I'll name three. Definitely one is Home Depot out of Cara. Those guys are great. They're doing a lot of buys, very mobile friendly. Uh, the head of mobile over there, Jason Newport, loves startups, loves working with great companies, has a big bet on mobile. So they're awesome. That's one. Two is uh, Pepsi. So they're, I mean, they're doing a lot of stuff, especially Brisk, Bodega, that brand over there. So kind of CPG. Um, and then third is I'm, I'm seeing Amex do a lot of stuff. Um, you know, Amex has a few teams that are interesting. One is the social team. So the social team kind of sits across everything and they blend in with the mobile. Um, then you've got, you know, new customer acquisition, which is a mix of branding and a little bit of DR, but they've got so many different teams doing so many interesting things that you know, they're willing to do real six-figure budgets out of the gate to do stuff, and I find uh, I find them really interesting. You know, and kind of the, the start of it all is most of these agencies have, you know, these kind of horizontal teams of social, one for social and one for mobile that meets with the startups, evaluates it, says, hey, come back and need some work, or this is great. Here are the brands that make sense. I think those guys are great to go into because they'll direct you towards, like, who you make sense for. I know, like, one... Uh, you know, I think it's like Bud Light, like those brands, like they're doing a lot of mobile, more branding than customer acquisition. So they make sense for us versus one other brand, just they do a bunch of DR and like we shouldn't be spending time with them. <clears throat> you know, actually one thing you mentioned, perhaps you might be of Coke. Um, and Coke also is interesting to us because not just the sector you know, is PCG, is CPG as well, but also that they're more experimental so they're willing to not just say we're spending money on mobile, but also we can actually work with them as they do repeat buys and say, you know, last time you wanted to target this kind of people. We've noticed that actually these other folks that's outside of your targeting parameters, they actually perform better. What do you think of doing that? What do you, doing, what do you think of doing a bit of more creative optimization based on the audience we're targeting? And those kind of things are, you know, we'll consider more value add that can have more cyclical relationship, partnership with brands that you know, obviously helps with the, the repeat buys, but also help uh, differentiate platforms from one another from what you can offer the brands. Mm -hmm. I was gonna add, um, we're seeing at least a local response, telcos are spending mm -hmm. a ton. I know Sprint and T-Mobile have become million dollar clients already for us mm -hmm. uh, this year, but conquesting and obviously makes sense for uh, telco to be advertising on mobile, so needless to say. Mm -hmm. um, Cool. So let's talk. So a lot of a lot of crazy stuff has happened in in the industry recently. I think in the past even two weeks, the the crazy thing about this landscape. I mean, I remember you know since even 15 years ago, every day, every week, things change so quickly, right? And um, you know, most recently, Twitter Mopub, Twitter's IPO, uh, Critio's IPO today, uh, their S1. So. Let's, you know, these are amazing kind of thought leaders on the panel. Let's let's kind of just rap about what's happening to the industry from a consolidation standpoint. What does Twitter Mopub actually mean for, for your company, for the mobile ecosystem? Um, and, uh, and, uh, and who are the key consolidators over the next few years? Who are the companies that might even acquire your company? We actually want to buy Google, but I think we have to wait a little bit until we've made a bit more progress. This industry is going to go through a ton of consolidation. The fact that there's a lot of companies going public also opens up a new market for startups because it means you've got this group of companies that can make sub-50, sub-100 billion dollar acquisitions. Uh, but there's a ton of things going on. Recently, you've had Tremor going public, you've had Yumi, you've had Velti just going all the way down, Twitter and Mopub, which we at Fungal call Twitpub because we have a few interesting thoughts on that, which we'll talk about later. You have uh, Millennial Media Bank, JumpTap, which was a crazy deal. And my view is that stock's undervalued. I'm not bullish on it the whole way, but you're buying two companies for the price of one. That stock is trading so low, it's crazy. But this 
Industry is going to continue to heat up. Things are going to continue to happen. Um, a lot of it's because investors want to see some kind of exit. And some of these companies are too bloated, have taken on too much money. They're not going to really sell for much. But the other side of it is some of these companies believe they can go the whole way. And, and some will because mobile and advertising are big, big trends. And then you've got companies who are building this arms race right now, like you've got Yahoo, Facebook, uh, Microsoft even a little bit, Google. Everyone's panicking trying to get into mobile, even AOL with the purchase of Adapt TV. So th things are going to get more nuts. And the, I don't know when the dust will settle, but everyone should keep a lookout. Lots of interesting things are going to happen, and this industry is going to change. I just hope, selfishly, being in the ad tech space, um, a lot of these companies that have gone public, even though they may be competitors, do well, because it bodes well for all of us if the industry does well overall. Yeah, I agree. And I think that you know, the biggest thing that happened over the last five years was Facebook's IPO. And you know, for a while, it was depressed. Um, and the main concern everyone had is, is Facebook going to be able to monetize mobile? And then when it came out and, and realized that Facebook was monetizing mobile and they were doing it you know, primarily with cost per install ads, the stock has, has really taken off as they continue to invest in that and figure out the right way to do that. I think that that being an indicator for any other leading internet company um, who you know, maybe had a big web business and, and has a very successful web business realizes that they really need to figure out their, their mobile strategy and not just what the user experience is, but also how they're monetizing. And so and I think Twitter's acquisition of Mopub was an excellent move. Uh, because, you know, as obviously they were planning to IPO a long time before they, uh, before they acquired Mopub, they recognized, uh, you know, through the process or whoever it was that, hey, you know, we have a pain point here in that we're not monetizing mobile as well as, you know, Facebook that really hurt their IPO. Let's get ahead of this and take care of that problem uh, before we even have to go out to market. So I think that you, you see that across those companies. And, and while that's happened, companies like Millennial, um, you know, going down and, and, and picking up jump tap or whatever, you know, people that were in that first round of, of uh, mobile ad technology companies, if they didn't join a really big ship like AdMob joining Google and, uh, you know, everyone else, uh, Quattro joining Apple and Graystripe um, and, and all those other folks, if you didn't join that really big ship, I think they, they found it really hard to keep competitive advantage over time as all those really big ships added technology from smaller ships and moved really, really quickly. So, um, you know, well, interesting to see what will happen there, but I think that's why, why you continue to see trends on people wanting to figure out how to monitor mobile. Who, who buys Tap Commerce, do you think? No comment. Okay. <laughs> well, the stocks are undervalued. No. Uh, so what's interesting, there's so many interesting things I was thinking, um, and one of the, I think one of the biggest trends I, is that a lot of companies started at a similar time, you know, between 07 and 2010. You know, a lot of ad tech companies started at, at that stage. And of course, now it's three years later, and uh, there's definitely some, imp some pressure from investors. Uh, but also, as ad tech companies, uh, it's a very capital intensive business. Uh, you know, IOs are, as we all know, there are cyclical cycles within the business itself that we have to take care of. But also, what's interesting is, is that not only are bigger ad networks buying smaller ones, or uh, but more big publishers are looking for um, great advertising platforms to help themselves to better monetize and position themselves. So with the Twitter MoPub one, is 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 actually multiple things. One, you know, Twitter to me is you know, it's great pub, it's a great publisher, one of the largest publishers that knows so much about each one of us, at least the users of Twitter. Um, buying MoPub, which is you know, I think the largest mobile uh, exchange, you know, they have really helped themselves set, set themselves apart in terms of how they may be able to monetize all the information the tour is sitting on. And that's really exciting. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. I, lost, I lost what I was thinking before. <laughs> Yeah, I would probably say that it all comes back to targeting. If you look at Facebook, why Facebook was so effective is their mobile advertising because they have this huge data set that they can use for targeting. So, and therefore they're successful. So if you look at the Twitter acquisition, you may say that this is a net network being added to, to huge data, that big data set that Twitter has. And there are only a few companies that, that have that kind of data set, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google, and so forth. So I guess we will still see this kind of uh, you know, conversion going on between uh, ad networks and big data companies that can use big data to drive mobile ads. Yeah. 
So I, I think mobile is technology's greatest misdirection trick, which is everybody, including this room, is looking at mobile instead of looking at what the big picture is called in 36 months. And that's not mobile first, but everywhere first. It's the fact that five years ago we had one screen. It was the desktop. Now it's desktop, it's tablet, it's smartphone, it's multiple tablets because you got a 7-inch one and a 10-inch one. It's You've got a smart TV, you've got a Google Glass, you've got some wristwatch coming, you've got a tablet in your car if you've got a Tesla or something like that. You've got iPhone in the car. So you've got so many different screens, right? Mobile's the most important one because that's where there's a ton of users. The smart companies like Twitter, Facebook, even Google are going not mobile first. You know, mobile's the most important. They're going everywhere first saying, how do we create the largest audience across every screen? So a common interface across every screen, that's one. Two is, how do we get technology that seamlessly lets us collect data and identify all those users across it. So I think a company like a tap ad or a drawbridge gets picked up by one of those guys really soon. All right, connect all those users across every screen. Think about Twitter's biggest deploy as a feature in the past year. Wasn't buying, I mean, Mopub was there. It was when you could finally sync your read and unread DMs and apps across every single device. That was the biggest thing they did because that was, we know where you are on every device and that's a common state. So get a common design across every single platform, common data, and then the agencies are going to say, hey, I don't want to do a mobile budget or this budget or that budget. I'm going to go spend a million bucks with Twitter. You know, I want 300000 on mobile, you know, 200000 on tablet, and 500000 on everything else. Google's already done that. If you look at what they did earlier this summer, you can't go as an advertiser and say, hey, I want a little bit of tablet, a little bit of mobile, a little bit of desktop. You give them 1000 bucks, and it goes across absolutely everything. There's no longer per device targeting. So that's already happening. It's not mobile first, it's everywhere first. Everything's going to consolidate and uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah, in fact, very good point because uh, my TV has Android in it, right? And now you can buy a projector that has Android in it. So soon it will be mobile everywhere. I mean, my TV is a mobile device from an advertiser's perspective. Mm. So yeah, there is definitely that kind of conversion. Yeah, don't, don't forget about cars either, right? You jump yeah, into your cars, Tesla exactly, and boom. Yeah, so it's, uh, iOS 7 has this new API for iOS in the car, which is, you know, 20 auto manufacturers are signed up that if you plug it in, you know, through the port, it actually goes onto the mm -hmm. screen. I haven't, I've seen screenshots. That's really, really cool. Very dangerous as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What's interesting about media consumption is that whether it's apps or mobile web, it doesn't really matter. But our view is that apps will transcend devices. You're not just going to have them on your smartphone or your tablet, not even just on your TV, but in your car, in the world around you. We're going to live in a multi touch screen environment. Like I said, remember kids, they love touching things. Um, even like Google Glass is going to have ads. Everywhere around you is going to be a monetizable. It's a screen. Yeah, exactly. Native Wangle ad on TV, that's interesting, right? Because, uh, yeah. No comment. <laughs> I mean, but you think about it, it's already happening now that like an iOS app, it's one binary. So originally like when App Store came out and iOS 2.0 was, hey, you built an iPhone binary. Then when the iPad came out, they said, hey, the SDK, now you have an iPad and iOS. That's why you see the little plus in the App Store for apps that do both. When they do TV, all they're going to do is say, hey, download on the TV or, you know, on your iPad or your iPhone is going to be a third binary for the TV. The car apps are also going to have a fourth binary. If they have a wristwatch, there'll be a fifth binary. It's, and all this is just adapting the design to whatever the experience is. Move the ads with it, all the ads. But user tracking is not available on those devices by default, right? So that's, that's a big complexity because on the web, cookie exchanges let us track user across all the different sites and then target advertising to the user's profile. This currently does not exist on mobile, too. Well, well th uh, there are, I mean, the companies you alluded to in the beginning, um, uh, Tap and Drawbridge, they do work with brand advertisers to do that. But, you know, the, the thing that brings together all those devices is IP address, which if you're looking across device and using IP, and if you're also using that information a bit on exchanges, you know, Google and Yahoo don't offer the last octet of the IP for, for, for bidding. So, you know, they, they say on their blogs and their sites that it's 60% uh, effective in terms of being able to target people across the device. And that 60% provides, provides a lot of value um, yeah. on, a, on a CTR uh, standpoint in terms of being able to convert um, customers. I think for using that for you know, analytics purposes or DR purposes, uh, not so much there. But for doing it for brands and lifting up a brand CTR, I think it's a, a, a great technology. Oh. Does everybody know uh, in the audience, by the way, who TapAd and, and Drawbridge are? So just uh, just a refresher, you know, 
this was a great, I thought this was a great conversation, by the way. So, you know, mobile is everything. Everybody has multiple devices. Uh, so companies like Trapad, Tapad, and Drawbridge are actually trying to bridge all these devices to say this user, user X, we know that this tablet and this, this iPad mini and this iPad and this phone and this PC are all tied to the same user. Right, so a company like Tapad can actually sequence ads across every device. So you see ad Creative 1 for Toyota on your iPhone. You see ad Creative 2 for Toyota on your iPad mini. Right, it's tying that back together to one common user. So it's increasingly important as you now have your wristwatch and your TV and your car. Uh, how do you tie all these devices, all these screens back to one user? Um, so it, it's pretty exciting, I think. Are any of you leveraging like that cross-platform data right now, and, and, and how are you doing that? So you know, right now, put it this way, like our publisher network is a little bit over a quarter of a billion people. We're only redirecting mostly for tablet because that's where we're focusing for the moment. But our JavaScript is on the page of every single one of those people, so we know we can do all the stuff that TapEd and Drawbridge does as a feature. So we know the desktop user, we can sync back to tablet where we're showing the ad if it's on a device where we redirect because it's a common platform it's an advertiser that advertises on us even if it's you know across a hundred different sites it's as common of a platform as a Facebook Twitter or Google so where we redirect very easy and then on the other devices you know about a quarter billion people because the JavaScript is there we can do you know all the crazy targeting that a Twitter or a tap ad does yeah. Yeah, I would just Sorry. say that there's a uh, so that tracking is great, but it tends to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and uh, there is also a lot happening in the uh, regulatory space, right? Do not track initiative, mm -hmm. and uh, Google is coming up with their own ad tracking yeah. ID. So there's a lot happening in that space that may disrupt the industry, so it's a very good, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I think that <coughs> one, one of the other issues with those type of solutions is the, the privacy part of it, like how are you able to opt out if the, the parameter, mm -hmm. I think Apple you know, really took a leadership position in, in setting up um, Apple's identity for advertisers, IDFA or IFA, so that they had a privacy compliant way that people could opt out and be in control of their uh, experience so. from a targeting standpoint. And Google, you know, it seems has, has followed suit after kind of seeing how things went. Um, there was an Android ID which was, was somewhat there because you could wipe it yep. by restarting it but now then moving stronger in that direction hopefully in the near term will afford that same thing um, certainly if you had bo and own both sides of the platform at at, um, at on swipe you could do that uh, but you know when, when you don't have or touch both sides of it and you're just going off of an IP address um, you know if, if you're on a cell phone uh, and you're on the same carrier your IP address is going to be the same uh, on a lot of carriers awesome. for those around you so so one one area where as of 19 minutes ago any startup at this table, and anyone in here might be completely screwed as iOS 7, you know, there's one minute difference that has a huge impact, and that's that third-party cookies have always been blocked by default since the inception of iOS, since Safari in 2003, except before iOS 7, it was, you know, what do you allow? It was, what are you opting into? And it was, you know, only from visited sites. So it was still blocking third-party cookies. The language was, hey, if they've gone to google.com, you can still drop that, that cookie. What changes in iOS 7, and this is on web, not app, is it's not what are you allowing, it's what are you blocking? And it says block cookies, and it now says from third parties and advertisers by default. So it's not only third parties, it's explicitly saying that, hey, everybody has opted into blocking cookies from advertisers. If there's ever a court case, that legal ruling would be very, very interesting because that means targeting is done. You know, 90s, nobody's going to go change this. So interesting where regulation can take this industry. Yeah. Yes. It's, it used to say, the default used to be allow cookies only from visited, which was not great, but at least the language wasn't disallowed advertisers. Now says Safari block cookies by default from third party. <laughs> um, you know, and that's like, hey, you know, only. 0.1% of the world that has iOS has had this. I think that's going to have tremendous implications. I also don't think it's right. You know? okay, so the other thing is that uh, on the iOS 7, the devices can talk to each other now. Uh -huh. so it's not like before you had uh, your phone talking to the cell tower. Mm -hmm. Now you can have multiple telephones talking to each other based on your context. Mm -hmm. So privacy is slowly disappearing, so you can base mm -hmm. advertising on context and where you are. Yeah. I think that, oh, go ahead. 
So I think context, I think it's key. I want to say I think it's a key word there because I know cookies is something that we talked about a lot because we came from the web browser world. And also, of course, mobile web, we have browsers as well. But I think context, whether it's location, whether it's activities, whether there are a lot of things we can tell about a person, whether or not that person is unique, that exact one person may not matter as much because all we care about we, when we do targeting, we are targeting about a group of people, a subset of people with specific kind of attributes. And it's, therefore, we're talking about subsets and not individuals. Um, it's interesting where privacy regulation can go. You would think it can destroy this industry completely, but actually that's not true. Uh, sometimes privacy can help. So take COPA compliance, for example. COPA says that you have to make sure that you're not knowingly collecting information from people who are under 13 and then sharing that with advertisers. Well, that forces you to then collect information so you know what your users are. And the big problem holding back mobile is demographic information. How do I know if this user is a male or female, if this person is 24 or 30? If I have that data, I can charge a lot to advertisers because I can give them the holy grail. Can I have a suggestion? Can I use the camera on the phone? to? to <laughs> But, but because of things like COBRA compliance, publishers now are starting to track these things, and that's good for the industry too. Yeah, I think I think I think that kind of you know, the publisher first first party data from publishers are going to be the kind of data that had to seed right the us as platforms because that is the or the origin of the data, and publishers do not you know do not ask this kind of information and doesn't have to be exact either. They can say, are you between the age of seventeen thirty four? Say yes or no, and those kind of practices I think will help. Uh, once they get passed on to um, advertisers and platforms, we can be also helping improving the experience of, of ads because of the relevance uh, as well. So I think we, we've, uh, we've covered all, all my topics. We spoke about ad units, native versus non-native attribution, the consolidation of the industry, brand advertisers versus direct response advertisers, metrics to prove ROI. Um, we, covered, we covered a lot of ground here. I thought this was a really good overview, so thanks. Um, everybody on the panel for, for your thoughts. I want to uh, break out to the audience and get some questions um, from you guys. First of all, I actually want to note a, uh, a, a legend in mobile advertising in the crowd today. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> in the crowd, buddy, in the crowd. Uh, her name, I'm going to put you in the spot, Heidi. Her name is Heidi Lee, and she's co-founder of, I think, the very first mobile ad network. No, when, when did you start? Oh, four you started. I started in 04. So almost 10 years ago, a long time ago. you started Third Screen Media. Right up there with you with Ipsh, so we were yep. both out there. Uh, and, uh, and it was acquired by AOL. AOL. Um, and so Heidi, I mean, this must be a, a flashback for you, right? Because you're probably hearing a lot of the same issues, right, yeah. that you were thinking about 10 years ago. Yep. But I love your perspective as to as how you feel like it has evolved or, or maybe evolved or I mean, some of the stuff sounded exactly the same, sort of what are the clients that are spending the most money and we're getting the brands versus the bond feeding. But I think what's interesting is when Nahal and I got into the space, it was all, the big thing was getting a carrier deal, right? Aligning with Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile and iOS didn't really exist and Android didn't exist. So that ecosystem is completely new. But I think the biggest point that I'm listening to that's so interesting is just the whole notion of multi-screen. So when we were in the space, it was all the experience begins with mobile. And I remember it was Syriac Redding, who's now the founder of what, Shopkit. He kind of came up with that term that, you know, this is your remote control of the world and everything starts here. But I think the gentleman that made the point <coughs> about it's really multi-screen, it's everywhere. It's following the user, not just on this screen, but on one iPad to the next, to the computer, then back here, and then maybe it's television. I mean, that's changed remarkably. Um, so it's it's interesting. And then wearables. I'm starting to advise a wearable company now. I mean, that wasn't even on the on the scene, and now everybody's focusing on. I need to know when I missed a call and <coughs> right away. I'll check it here, then I'll look here, and then I'll go to my iPad. So I think the year of mobile's upon us. One of these days. Finally, we've been <laughs> saying this. We've been saying next year's the year of mobile since like '99. Well, I know. Keep waiting. Uh, I think Until it's only I missed it. It was a couple of years ago. It was? Oh, yeah, the fresh release went out. Oh, uh, no. Um, so you're going to jump back into mobile advertising? Can we get you to come back or no? Um, it might be. It yeah. might be. So th this panel is enticing. So. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Man. I had a question regarding um, what you've discussed and opt-in. So if we go back to uh, some of the original advertising, direct marketing, recall that we used to be bombarded with phone calls and direct calls into our home which probably most everyone here has said, I don't want that, stop it. 
not interested. So we've talked a lot about how advertisers can reach consumers, of which I would say probably most consumers are not all that interested in most of what's being fed to them. So my question is, do you see opt-in as being a, a, an increasingly viable way for consumers to say, you know what, I'll take the content, but here's what I'll hear from willingly, and here's what I really don't want to hear from. So I, I, listen, I think consumers are generally lazy folks, right? Like, so I, consumers I suck. <laughs> no, like well, people, unfortunately, the business depends on that. I, no, I mean that in a way of like absolutely of like they love playing Angry Birds. They just want to get to the game. They don't want to go like change their Safari settings and say like this brand. Even if five, let's say five percent do, a that's a ton of people. But in the grand scheme, that doesn't move the needle. So I think you know the way you've got to do it is have it down at the ad unit level where. I think Tabula introduced last week, thumbs up, thumbs down. Hulu's been doing this for years. But to have a you know worldwide what Apple just did and what Mozilla's been preaching, frankly, I think it, it should be illegal because here's the problem. As a publisher, you've got two ways to make money. Charge for content or take the attention of the user and monetize it. Nobody wants to pay for content, right? At least in a massive scale that's gonna let this industry exist. So make better ads, let users say at the ad level, you know what, I like this interest, I don't like this interest, I think you get it better, but to just say, hey, we're gonna cut out all ads, we're gonna wait for consumers to say they like these two or three brands, like, I think that kills you know, tens of thousands of jobs at publishers and advertising companies. Yeah, I would like to second that. As a vendor, I, I had the opportunity to experiment with that. So I have a paid application. You can pay, let's say, $5 and use it with, with no ads whatsoever and no distraction or you can get the free application, but then you would see the ads, or you would have to give up some private information. 99% of users go for the free application. It's a, uh, yeah, so this issue may be a little bit, uh, yeah. To that, to that well, well, answer your question? Really. Okay. Um, because what I'm describing is something between free and paid, so if consumers were given, like, you know, here's 10 or 100, you can have it for free, but here's 10 categories. Will you listen to ads regarding travel, or food, or cars, or grocery stores? Pick one, and then we'll try to make certain that the ads are in that zone, and yeah. you can get the content. Advertisers will pay 10 times more for that because people have committed to that advertising. Brian, this is like so Boniflex, right? Um, that's what I was speaking to. Yeah, who does it? I think it's awesome. Hmm. It's just every publisher needs to, to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that to your point, um, getting in the opt-in screen, and there, there are people that are successful having uh, opt-in ads uh, on mobile, you know, sometimes entering an email address or saying they want to learn more about something. But also to date, uh, a lot of mobile ads um, haven't been relevant to the cons uh, customer. If, if you go to Google and you see the, the ads on Google as you're searching for something, you know, no one's complaining about those ads because they're so targeted and relevant to what you're currently doing that it's a great experience, right? And, and, and you, you love it. I think that the, the challenge to people up here and a lot of other people in the industry is how do you take that type of experience and make it that relevant to the customer within mobile and maybe it's through ways that you described like collecting that data and, and letting people opt into what type of uh, information they want to receive um, or it's finding good ways to, to look at and structure that data to show something um, to the right person when it's contextually relevant to that to that user so that's, that's certainly a problem that all of us I think are um, you know, working really hard on trying to resolve and, and certainly user provided data is excellent, um, as is uh, data that we can try to gather up and, and use the best way that we can. But you know, the, the movement in general towards mobile um, being uh, exchange traded via RTB and, and programmatic has added a lot of additional uh, data that, that companies are being able to use to, to figure out the right way to, to make that uh, make that a better, more relevant experience. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I'm probably going to sound like I'm drunk on the ad tech Kool-Aid here. But the thing is, when you talk about opt-in, opt-out, you're viewing advertising as an intrusive experience. And a lot of advertising is intrusive. But if you can make it relevant and engaging, the Blur, the boundaries between advertising content start to blur. And if you can make advertising a part of the app experience where it seamlessly integrates, for example, with apps we work with, they might decide, you've just finished playing this game, you've been using it for a while now, if you want to continue, watch an ad, or you've just played this level, you died, start again, or watch an ad and you get a free life and you continue. Making advertising a part of the user experience is the answer rather than looking at it as opt in, opt out. Not, I mean, to be honest, I don't want to see these annoying ads that appear at the top of the screen which I accidentally click on. But if it's part of the content, I'm not going to complain. Actually, I like that. Amen. Uh, so, so there's one more thing. I think what's interesting is that we talk about uh, 
information from a publisher level per publisher, per app, information opt and opt out at the browser level, and also now potentially at the, at the platform level, iOS versus Android. So I think you brought, what I was thinking more about is that if Apple was to ask you know, for every iOS user about your preference at the iOS level, and that kind of information is it what every app developer can pick up from the, the, from the OS and then provide to the advertisers, that would be pretty powerful. Instead of every single publisher having to ask individual, individual users. That's a very interesting point, which I'm not sure it was part of the plan for, for Apple to do, but that could be pretty powerful. Questions? Yeah, spot on. And in our case, what we've realized is there's no point showing the same performance ad to the user if that user's not going to convert. We are taking up valuable inventory. And if we're not monetizing that impression, don't show the user the ad. What we view is the less ads we show, the better. And because we get paid by performance, if you're going to keep clicking XXX, I've learned something about you. You're not going to you're not going to interact with that. So you know, fine, we won't show you any more ads. But the users, there are some users, and this is the case, like one or two, three percent of users actually like the ads. And they love it. It's like going to the cinemas. It's a movie trailer. It's an app trailer. And they want a recommendation. They want to download another app once they're finished using it. Those users are valuable, and you should try to monetize them. But the other users, don't, don't go in their face, because you know what? You're going to end up with bad reviews. And if you have bad reviews, now Apple actually looks at your reviews as part of the rankings. Guess what? You're going to fail. So you have to make sure that the user experience is solid. Let's say I go on Amazon and I buy, I don't know, a spinning laser gun toy from my nephew. And then I buy it. All I can see everywhere on my desktop for the next two weeks are spinning laser toys. I don't need one to take this guy. And this, to me, I'm, I'm sure everyone else experiences this. Post purchase, why do people get bombarded with the same advertising? So I guess the question is why isn't Google addressing this? Because you're obviously not thinking about it. And who is it? What is the future of it? And, and I have a question for you. Uh, I really want a spinning laser toy gun, so I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering where I could get one, so we'll sync up after the pen. Okay. The spinning laser toy gun. That's a good purchase. First off, uh, second off, when I refer to uh, Google Ads, I'm, I'm referring to when you're in search, right? I'm, I'm not referring to Google's network as much. I'm referring to you search in Google, you see the text ads that are relevant to what you were searching for. What you're referring to is retargeting, and what's happening there on the web is. No, uh, across AdSense or other Google, Google stuff, sure. They're, they have a network, and um, they'll, they'll gather that data. Um, the, the issue is that, in that case, um, you as being someone who added that to cart, they figured out you added it to cart, but for whatever reason, they didn't know that you purchased it. And so they just have a big segment of people that they're targeting to add it to cart. Um, the, the, the issue there is sometimes people don't want to share if someone actually purchased or who the purchase information was, because that probably is private information for Amazon in that example. So they figured out they could just show ads to everyone who adds to cart. Um, it, it is an annoying thing, and I've seen it myself as well. And I mean, we, we, we run a lot of programs that do cart abandonment and uh, work really hard to try to not show the ad to someone if they did indeed purchase the product. So you're saying that so Amazon what gets added to cart, but does not release information generally of what's been purchased. That's considered private. Right, because, well, they don't want to release whether or not someone made a purchase, because then all of a sudden they're disclosing information on their, their numbers and who they're selling to and what their conversion rates are. So you will run into that issue where someone shares the add to cart information. But yeah, it is it is far better when you when you aren't uh, showing something that someone who what they already bought. So much of it is backwards looking and not, mm -hmm. what is the intent of this customer? What do they want to do? Where do they want to travel? It's, right. Where have they just been? What have they just bought? Mm -hmm. And that is... Like the most I think I think you brought a good point about actually the feedback piece because there's no way to give feedback on those ads. Imagine you can hover over the unit that you're not interested in, say no more, and then it disappears. So of course the the, the enclosed uh, publishers like Hulu, for example, you know, do have those. Are you interested? Not interested? And therefore they can start tailoring. But I think across that networks, those kind of mechanisms have not been implemented. But those kind of features would be helpful. To give it feedback. Sorry, you mentioned a company that does that, the thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, I mean, like it's, it's on a per you know per publisher network uh, basis. Tabola, which is content recommendations, you know, basically, hey, if you get recommended, you know, an article for you know 
entertainment here on our sports side or you just don't like it, you can now, as of last week, say X or check whether you like it. And their, their monetization scheme is, hey, they put the recommendations across the entire interweb and you know, increase engagement, yada, yada. One out of five of those are paid by another publisher or brand. Hey, you can also say the ad, you know, from let's say GE that's promoting their content. You can go X or check on that as well. And I think, I think that should be everywhere. I think that should be on every ad. The problem is, you don't have a common interface, right? You know, and most ad networks, you know, ad tech ad networks aren't really tech companies. They're just selling media. They're not thinking, hey, how do I make a better user experience? Whereas I think everybody on the panel here is thinking user experience first, and that's going to save publishing. But that may be a good topic for a startup, right? Predictive targeting. And, and it, it is very hard because it's very difficult to express verbal rules. If you bought this, then you might buy something else. Yeah, the first step is to figure out what you bought. Right? Yeah, but that, that technology, I, I actually read some research uh, recently about neural networks and they use for predictive targeting. Because we can train a neural network uh, on a large data set about if uh, this set of people bought this, they usually buy this. And then you can apply it to, to predictive targeting. Well, how do you buy too? Like, you buy again? So it's, it's, it's not a problem there, too. It's yeah, there, there is repeatable, yeah, there is repeatable business like that. Yeah. And so they have to basically plug in, you know, identifiers like what would you not buy in two or two weeks. That's pretty late. Late. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's, it's very easy to write an analysis model that, that analyzes what happened. It's very difficult to write one or express one that predicts what's going to happen, and that's where it's coming from. Yeah. The next panel at Oric will be about spinning laser toy guns. <laughs> Are we negative advertising by content companies affecting What do you mean? Could you repeat that? Are we negative advertising by content companies affecting So native advertising by content companies, how does that affect you guys? So take a BuzzFeed, for example, right? I think for, I think what's interesting about BuzzFeed and the native advertising is they started to, I think this actually the word come to mind standard. Because of the scale that BuzzFeed does have and the kind of the effect it has and the kind of experience they expose people to, people go to BuzzFeed and read their article at the time and they are saying, oh, this is the adver native advertising. And just setting that kind of standard slash definition is, is why I see the most impact. And of course, for us, native uh, definition is a bit broader and also more toward less of the content itself, but more the user experience. So there's a derivative for us. And that's where I see the kind of impact. I think Jason touched on this earlier about Twitter, for example. Every content company, or every publisher's dream is to become the standard and for their content to be the line item on the IO of the advertiser, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever. That's why it made sense for Twitter to purchase MoPub. It gives them the DNA because they have to embrace that. It, Facebook had to embrace it. Google had to embrace it. So Twitter went ahead and did it as well. In our case, it doesn't affect us much because mobile video is big and television is changing, it's becoming more and more mobile. But I think this is such a big industry, there's room for everyone, and there's room for more. I know we don't want more standards, we don't want just yet another ad unit, but there is room out there. And I think yeah. the real intelligence will be deciding what mix of advertising works for you as an advertiser. It's, it's scale, it's you know, scale and standardization, right? So like a few individual publishers have enough scale, right? So call it BuzzFeed being the leader, you know, that's one. And then how do you have third party platforms? ShareThrough is a great one doing that. Um, you know, the other way we do it on mobile where we're saying, hey, we've got, you know, thousands of publishers and we're reaching, you know, an audience, you know, many times larger than BuzzFeed on tablet. Would you like to do that, right? So it's either become a publisher and do it yourself and it's a great ad unit, but you've got to have scale. You can't be a, you know, a million visits a month publisher or, hey, native is hot. Native makes a lot of sense. How do you create a platform that does that? You know, I think guys like, uh, like ShareThrough have done that very, very well. In the back. Yeah, I have a few questions. The first part is, how did these guys determine what's the best pricing model to approach advertisers with? And then I'll ask the second one there. If we can just go through. Yeah, we just started making it up initially. I'm serious about it. Like, yeah. how much is SuperSoul willing to pay for an install? I don't know. Let's look at what the publisher wants in terms of how much revenue does it take to make that publisher happy. After a while, though, we found the demand and supply, and we got a lot more intelligent with tracking and targeting. But in the early days, it really was, wow, someone's willing to spend money with me. This is amazing. How much can I make? I'm going to charge just enough so they continue to spend with me, but also a large enough amount where I can keep my margin and make the publisher happy. But after a while, you, once you get to scale, once you have hundreds of advertisers and millions of dollars flowing through, you have to focus on optimizing. A small optimization difference can mean huge differences for you in terms of the bottom line you get to keep. So you will get intelligent through technology. 
So we, well, we do uh, everything via real-time bidding. Um, so you know, when, when we're bidding, the price that's being uh, paid by the advertiser is influenced by what the market demand is uh, to reach that individual consumer. So uh, as far as efficiency goes, I think that um, you know, we, we certainly Mopub and, and Twitter is a nice move in the direction of uh, more inventory becoming exchange traded. Uh, I think that for people on the DR side, getting that type of efficiency is really important, but I can't speak to the brand. Right. So as you saw from our side, it's interesting is, you know, similar to, to Zhang, we, at the beginning, because brand dollars were very rare in the mobile space, we did have to test quite a bit. And also the, um, it's also had a lot, uh, many factors in terms of pricing. What kind of ad unit is it, was it v what's the format of it? Is it display? Is that going to be more immersive, interactive ad? Is going to be a video? How long is the video? Uh, do we do creative, et cetera? So these are factors are all factored in, but over time, we have, um, you know, the pricing has stabilized quite a bit for us, so we know how, what to go in with, and also depending on the quarter, of course, as well, and which which um, which sector to to um, and what what they're willing to pay. So it's more these factors determine our pricing. So the the one thing we focus on is what is the blended rate CPM, right? So we're you know what we really focus on are these super high impact full page units or real native advertising that's sold on a CPV, those are really high at an individual rate, number one, right? So if you went to a publisher and said like, to a brand and said like, hey, buy something at a $30 to an $80 CPM out the gate, depending on which product, that's gonna scare them a little bit. What we do is, so one is, you know, pricing, two is going in and blending that in with standard units, right? So A, that's gonna drive, that's gonna drive down the blended rate. So, you know, when the client looks through, you know, who are all the people that submitted the RFP and you're gonna make the plan, like they care about the blended rate. What is an optically good number, especially for a new company, right? That's one, you know, two is if you wanna be able to, let's say the pricing was already good on the non-standard units, for them to buy that, they still have to buy some of the standard stuff. So it's kind of a how do you blend it all together? Non-standard, which is still high impact and performing, and you know, the standard stuff down a rate that makes sense, and we just tweak that, that blending where like one plan they might say like, hey, you know, I need a lower blended rate, the IV is too high, but you know, the regular one is good, you know, the high impact stuff is good enough. So it's on a per, per basis, but we pretty much nailed like where we need to be in the market. Yeah, it's true. Targeting allows you to get a lot better with pricing. Yeah. It allows you to actually reduce the prices you charge to your customers. Yeah. In our case, because we've identified this portion of users here respond more to performance ads, now that I know I'll only show these guys performance ads, and I can reduce the performance price I charge to advertisers, on the other side, now I've got this huge base of users here who respond more to brand ads. I can charge a much lower CPM to McDonald's and Ikea or Sony or whatever, because I know overall we'll make more money because of targeting. They will pay for data. Yeah, so, so the quick answer is as much as we can get. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second question is, a lot is being made of data cards. You know, Google has their, their Google cards, and then um, iOS has their, their passbook, right? Um, what role do you see that playing in our lives from an advertising standpoint? And, and is this kind of the the app exchange or the app store for brands? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it gives another chance on mobile for um, attribution to the end um, you know, behavior that we're trying to drive, which is some sort of monetizable transaction. So if they're not making the purchase via you know, an in-app purchase or typing in their credit card information on the device, we can also see actions that are happening in other places and get proper attribution for that. And you know, there's a lot of companies out there trying to figure out the attribution side of this and, and solve that, which is still in its infancy as well. Yeah, one question. In the beginning, you guys talked about the people who control the budgets, and I guess you know there are the Don Drapers that are still alive for the martinis. They're actually um, not. They're the 24-year-old media buyer. Right. So and it's not a martini, it's like a Pabst Blue Ribbon, but yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I think you identified their uh, blind spot. They're not seeing where the market is right now. And what is the blind spot of the industry? What do you know that you don't know? And what do you know you don't know at all? So, uh, so I think there's like, there's people that spend the money, right? So like that's the 24-year-old media planner, like underpaid, they've got to spend the money, like, so you got them, right? The actual money spenders. The way that you get them to pay attention, especially as a startup, right? Because like they've already got the must buys of Google, Facebook, Twitter, yada yada. Um, you find like the higher level people who 
you could say can the Don Drapers control the budget, but what they really do is they're high level. You make them like you, right? Like, and that's either through you're bringing in folks that they trust. They, number one, their job is to find innovative things, you know, and seem thought leaders and do new things. And two is like, a lot of them actually, like, they're creative folks, care a lot about startups. So spend time with them, get them to believe in you so they can shift money. So they can say like, hey, I like this, you know, X brand proposal is coming out, like, give on swipe a 50K test. If it performs, you know, don't fuck that up. But otherwise, like, they'll continue to spend. So it's spending time with both parties and then somewhere in between are those vertical, so those horizontal guys I talked about, if you're in social, you know, the social team, if it's, you know, mobile, the mobile team, and, like, you got to hit all those different folks. Yes, I finally get to disagree with you because I would agree with you a lot today, right? Of course, the 24-year-old person does control mm -hmm. uh, the media buyer or whatever, but actually they can't go ahead and spend tens of millions of dollars on some experimental technology. Everyone's going to continue to spend on te television and print and radio and Super Bowl because everyone else does, and it's safe and it's low risk. If it doesn't work, well, I still had to do it because everyone else did it. Then you're not going to be able to graduate and get those $10 million campaigns because yep. even if you have scale, their job is on the line and they don't want to risk that much money at stake. It's like a big hedge fund putting all its money into one tiny stock. Yeah, that's 10 million risk. bucks is different. <laughs> We're talking that's what it will take for this industry to move. The reason Marimika's slide shows 3% ad spend versus 12% time is you can get test budgets all day long. To get the real revenue, the generational shift has to happen. The, the mindset of the people who control the spend has to change too. Yeah, like, like the way I'm thinking of it is you've got like in my mind 60k and under is test budget, then you've got 60k to 500k is hey like real spend still being done by a media planner, then 500k above is the high level guys of it's probably not 500k but seven figures like they're like they're the ones doing it. That I think is a different buy. So we agree and disagree. I think. Yeah, it's just we come from a world where television dollars, uh, the amount of money advertisers spend is obscene, hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes. So we want to get to that scale, but that's that's a, not a pipe dream, but that's going to take time, and that's why this is a long-term play for many of us here. AOL's doing that awesome, though. But there, AOL, is a, yeah. Yeah, there is a very good way to measure performance of a, of a TV at the budget, right? Uh, it's very difficult still to measure performance of a mobile ad, and I think when those tools are available, it will be easier to, to communicate value and get larger deals. So I, I just got the, the hook. She, right. Joyce said that we had to leave the room. I said, there's no way in hell we're leaving. But uh, <laughs> apparently we have to. As you can tell, we can talk about this for hours, days, weeks. You guys didn't get a chance to pitch uh, Dimitri Miller to that outside. But thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody.